with thrifty new plan. Is there water in your hairspray? There shouldn't be. Water takes the shape out of your hairdo. You need the water-free hairspray. Self-styling Adorn. Adorn's water-free formula puts shape into your hair and keeps it there. Actually holds up to twice as long. So put shape into your hairdo and keep it there with the water-free hairspray. Self-styling Adorn. Well, how do you do, sir? I understand this is your first taste of Carling's Black Label Beer. Uh, yes. And, sir, what is your reaction? Well, I like it. Good. Perhaps you can be more specific. How would you describe the flavor? Uh, I like it. <laughs> Good. Light? Yes. Dry? Uh, yes. And what else? I like it. Good. And the quality of Black Label. Oh, I like it. Good. Would you say it was high quality? Yeah, yeah. Or top quality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. It's premium quality at the popular price. I like that, too. <laughs> Good. And now, sir, see all those people out there? Uh, where, where? You, sir, have been co-starring on TV with everybody's favorite, Carling's Black Label Beer. Oh, you don't say. Mabel, Black Label. Hi, Mabel. like that it's thursday night and you know what that means it's party time with the video bros i'm one half of that team i'm bobby munson and beside me the man with the angelic voice papa smokes 
Papa Smokes. Happy Thursday, brother. How are you doing? Happy Thursday to you, Munson. I'm doing great, and I'm totally excited to be here for another episode of Ring Respect Radio, and especially since this is our next trip through the territories. Whoa, I'm pumped about this. Oh, so very so stoked, Papa Smokes. This has been a absolutely amazing series here. One of the most successful series that we've had here on Ring Respect Radio. I'm glad that there's been this high level of interest into the history of professional wrestling. It's not only a learning experience for the both of us, but also hopefully a learning experience for some of the viewers out there as well, too. Thank you for all of you who tune in, whether it's here on OLE or on the Video Bros Network. We appreciate the subscribes giving us a thumbs up notification bell and leaving comments. If you're here live in the chat, comment live with us, talk to us. If you are watching on replay, make sure to get those comments in and we will get back to you as well too. Always love talk chat about some professional wrestling. Uh, we are going to be talking tonight specifically about central States wrestling out of Kansas city. Pop smokes. But first, before we do that, I don't Maybe not a lot of people got to see it here in the live vibe view just yet. Cause uh, people are still rolling in, but that opener there that people are going to see oh. on the replay and stuff like that. How do you like the new the new intro, Papa Smokes? I absolutely love it, Munson. You did a great, great job of that. It sets the tone for what we're going to talk about, showing some of those old fight cards, showing the ticket stub, showing some clips from the old Memorial Auditorium and all that. Just absolutely great work, Bob. Yeah, and I'm going to be able to... Keep expanding on it as we go along, especially once we get more guests on the show. As, of course, we had, uh, you know, we've only had two guests so far, so a lot of clips to take outside of having the two of us on here. But we will have more guests, I'm sure, of it joining us as we take this trip through the territories, a, a show that we're going to continue on maybe until, well, no, I, I was going to say until there's no more territories. But once we get all the way around this world here, Papa Smokes, who's to say we don't have to do our round twos at some of these places? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, from the from the look of the list we made the rough list there there's it's going to be going for a while we got uh, probably two more years before we have to <laughs> yeah. repeat anything that's true that's true and again if these keep being that much that popular maybe we'll have to start throwing a few extras in every once in a while just to uh, give the people what they're what they're asking for anyway yeah very cool and you talked about people, viewers being able to learn from the, this series and us being able to learn. This was a particular episode in which I learned a lot doing the research for this. I've obviously watched a number of matches from Central States Wrestling in Kansas City and St. Louis in the past, but I didn't really know a whole ton about the entire history of this territory. So a lot of this was new ground for me too and a lot of fun looking into Wow, I had no idea it was such a vibrant territory uh, and promotion at that time. Oh, huge. And again, like, as we get into this, too, again, um, Bob Geigel, who's, good, you know, the big central booker in terms of this territory and stuff like that, not the one who originally initiated the company itself, but eventually became the well-known booker of the territory. Nothing but amazing things said about him and the way he allowed the boys to handle their matches and stuff like that. A very different approach that he took to the whole situation as opposed to maybe the way it was set in other territories. Yeah, he, Geigel was the guy that brought it from the old school into the new, had good business acumen, had good sense of uh, relations between the promoter as himself and the booker and the boys because he had been a fairly successful wrestler for a long time former U.S. champion and all that. So, I mean, it was a recipe for success, and they took the ball and ran. Oh, hell yeah. They certainly did. And I even learned about, again, you know, here's here's a name I'm going to bring up with you, Pop Smokes, and I know I've heard the name, but I've never really investigated the name that much. And Orville Brown was one of the ones that was mentioned very heavily throughout my studies of the Central States wrestling and stuff like that. Um your memories or knowledge on Orville Brown, and it seems like he had a massive impact on this particular territory. This was that one particular territory where Orville Brown really cemented his name. Very much so. And, and before he was ever a promoter and a booker and all that kind of stuff, he was a very prominent wrestler through the uh, 40s and, and some of the uh, Wild West days of professional wrestling. Orville Brown was a a hooker, so to speak, a, a shoot fighter, just like um, some of the greats we know from the past, including 
Strangler, Lewis, and Luthez, and the like. Uh, Brown, a massive superstar in wrestling, a world champ several times over. And uh, one of the guys that, you know, a, a lot of the research for this episode reminded me of Stampede Wrestling. In a way, it's a, it's a territory that's set far away from most of the major metropolitan centers. It doesn't have a giant population to draw from. But they had a Orville Brown, who was a, a bona fide classic wrestler, very popular wrestler, very well known and very well respected. He started up his new thing. Well, it had existed in certain forms before him, but he was the one that really laid the groundwork to getting a, a thriving promotion going in the middle of the Midwest there, um, running in Kansas City, Kansas, and also in Missouri and also in Iowa, and uh, and really just branched out that promotion to run four or five major cities and a couple of small towns, along with TV each week. And that, oh, that was the early days. In the early 50s of television, it made all the difference in promoting wrestling. Yeah, yeah it really did. Uh, and we're saying hello right now to our good friend BDJ joining yeah. us on the house saying, What up, boys? What up, BDJ? Thanks for joining us, brother. Appreciate you always checking out Ring Respect Radio and always being there supporting what we do and just being an overall great dude. Um, but yeah, going back to what you're saying here, Pop Spokes, um, just absolutely amazing the uh the things that were done and like the comparisons you make to Stampede Wrestling to really shine through. Again, it's you know, it was big in its own right but again away from like what you said the major metropolitan centers and stuff like that but talking about the names that came through or the names that really cemented things here let's talk about harley race like let's again we we talk about him in every territory that we come through but here we go the man that actually from kansas city and a man who went on to really kind of put kansas city and central states wrestling on the map in so many big ways harley rice maybe one of the greatest of all time i i would like to know especially from yourself where you rank somebody the likes of harley race in terms of all-time professional wrestling oh very very high and and it's weird nowadays because if you show a young modern wrestling fan harley race matches they won't get it they won't see it it's it's such a different style i mean like for the people that love kenny omega and that kind of thing that there couldn't be two more polar opposite wrestlers than Harley Race and Kenny Omega. One's a methodical worker. The other one does every move he can think of as fast as he can, sells absolutely nothing, nor does his opponent. And that's not to speak down on it. It's just two vastly different styles. But to bring Harley Race up after Orville Brown is in interesting because Brown, as a, as a champion and as a Central States champion, I believe we've lost Papa Smokes to the uh, freezing effect here at the moment. Uh, we, I, Papa Smokes, will be right back with us. I'm sure, certain of that. Okay, there we're he back. Is. There he is. All right. So, well, right when I was going there too. But oh, I know you're on a roll. <laughs> but uh, have at it again. Let us let us know where you're at. But Orville Brown, as a Central States champion, that he's covering a lot of ground as a, <laughs> as a champion there, covering a lot of geographical ground. From St. Louis, like I say, to Iowa, to, to Missouri, to Kansas. He was kind of like the blueprint for the traveling world champion, which was, of course, to be very influential once the NWA got formed, the National Wrestling Alliance, where the promoters all got together and said, you know what we should do is we'll elect and agree and vote upon one world champion who will tour all of the territories that are members of the NWA and defend his title wherever we want him booked. And he's, the champion is there, usually to retain his belt, but to put over each territory's top star and show that it doesn't matter where it is, Kansas City, Tampa, Florida, Carolina, anywhere, once that champion comes and wrestles the top guy in that territory, make him look good and make the fans believe, wow, our top guy can hang with the world champion. 
He just about beat him. Boy, was that close. Yep. We'll get him next time. That was the business model entirely for the NWA. Brown started that without really knowing, without having a plan, without thinking that this was going to be something for the future. But then it was Harley Race, once he got the NWA title, that really started that touring network throughout all the smaller promotions, even sometimes doing spot shows in small towns, but definitely doing the major markets, the Memphis, the Dallas, the, all the all the big cities in the uh, in the NWA's region, and making their top guys look good. Of course, the wrestler that would take that to even greater fame and greater heights was, of course, right after Harley Race, Ric Flair, the ultimate touring champion. But Harley Race and and, and before him, Orville Brown really set that blueprint for how the NWA's champion was going to work. Yeah, and again, I, I to go back to Orville Brown again, the first ever NWA World Heavyweight Champion, uh, and then Harley Race having won his first ever NWA Ch Heavyweight Championship was from Dory Funk uh, Jr., and that was in Kansas City itself as well, too, so the people of Kansas got to see their top star topple the NWA Champion at the time, and that was, again, like you're talking about, that business model where You've seen them hang, you've seen them hang, you've seen them hang, and then that one time, that one magical time when the moment was right and that belt changed and that was the next guy to be the guy, it was magical for that particular territory to get that opportunity to witness that live. Absolutely, and, and this model worked for the, for the territories for a long time, for a lot of years, and you can see how it, how it would work. This is, of course... It's during the era of television, but so much more revenue was made off of live show gates that that's how the companies were making their money. As we all know, you had to pack them into the buildings. You had to sell those tickets, get those bucks in those seats, and that's how they did it. Nowadays, it's a little different with TV rights and sponsorships. You make a lot of your money through that, but in these days, you wanted the fans there and Boy, they got a reaction sometimes bringing that world chat to town. Well, and, the, you know, you talk about nowadays with TV rights and stuff like that. You don't necessarily need the audiences, but the audiences sell your show. And that was the best thing about these times. And you go back and watch these matches, and you hear how fired up those crowds get, and it sells it. So even if you're not necessarily somebody who grew up watching this, again, I didn't grow up watching this kind of stuff. I was introduced to early WWF when I started getting into pro wrestling, this has been a whole learning curve for me this whole way through. But watching it, it's like, man, those crowds are massive. And they're heated. And they're loving the shit out of this stuff. And they sell it. It doesn't matter. These guys could be doing, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, choke, you know, not a choke hold, but, a, you know, they're they're doing hold, rest holds. It rest holds for half the matchup. And the matches aren't necessarily long. Most people sit there kind of boring if they have, to the modern fan. But... You oh yeah! How fired up these crowds get, and especially when the baby face starts firing back up and has those comebacks and everything like that. Those crowds sell your show, and that is the best part about it. And like BDJ saying, kind of like a PPW crowd. Yes, as much as we can try to put it over on YouTube, nothing puts it over better than that live audience. And again, I went and listened to some of our earlier PPW stuff, and the crowds weren't quite there yet, and you can hear it not having that same ambience that we have now, that electric ambience that comes along with it. And that's exactly what you get when you go back and watch any of these territory shows on YouTube, especially Central States Wrestling. There's some good shit there to watch. Absolutely. And, and it's a different style, too. I mean, we talked about this before. It, it was a different time and a different style. And, I mean, I know that you and I both watched as – doing uh, prep for this show, watch some of the full episodes of All-Star Wrestling, which you can tear in a whole bunch of playlists on YouTube. What a good time that is. What a good sense of the product they were putting out. You can get by watching the whole show instead of just separate matches. You can look up your favorites. You can watch Harley Race matches all day or Stomper matches or Bulldog Bob Brown matches all day long if you want to. But if you want to get a good sense of the product, I always like watching the show right from 
ill Kirsten at the very beginning. Hello, wrestling fans. I mean, that's just so <laughs> cool and so classic. I knew you would be loving that one, Muzz. Yeah. Because it's oh, almost I- like some of the intros you've done organically, but to hear that guy doing that back in 1963 and stuff like that, like how cool is that? Oh, it's fantastic. I love it. And I've even got it in my notes here to talk about him as well, too, because yeah. in research, I mean, there's this whole documentary that I watched about the company, and he's on there talking about how he was rejected the opportunity to be the, the ring announcer at first. He was told that, no, you don't have what it takes. You're not the right guy, stuff like that. Go away kind of thing. And then the guy they had couldn't fulfill his duty. So he was right there. He's like, put me in coach. Kind of like, I mean, he just kept persisting until the point where it was like, all right, here, okay, you can go out there for tonight. And then as he says, he goes, they put me out there for that night. And I was stuck around for 15 more years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And didn't you find the commentary to be quite good on, on central States yeah. wrestling? Oh, all yeah. those matches I watched. Kirsten is excellent. He sounds fresh all the time. He's got an excellent vocabulary. He keeps it very serious. He's not quite as serious as Ed Whalen, who is <laughs> definitely serious sometimes. But Bill, Bill Kirsten is excellent on on play-by-play commentary. I'm not sure who the other guy was on some of those, but he was good too. I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I thought the commentary was. Oh, I think we've lost. Sure. Oh, we lost your audio for a second there, up Pop Smokes. Oh, my back on? No, you're back on now. Yeah, we just lost you for okay, a second. Good. I think my uh, earbuds are cutting out here too, but we'll deal with that in a second. Uh, yeah. I, I just I was inspired to listen to a whole bunch of this commentary because those guys were really good, and and you and I can learn something from pros that came over from other sports and other forms of broadcasting and just killed it in wrestling. Oh, for sure. And I, I'm i not going to lie to you. And doing all the research that we've done through this whole series uh, has me listening to these commentators from these different territories. And I say, like, every time we listen to more people, I draw from things I hear and get inspired by things I hear. Not that you're necessarily stealing or anything. Like, you pay an homage to the greats that paved the way. They know how to do it best. They did do it best. And it doesn't hurt to learn from and adapt what they've done into your own kind of style sort of thing very much so and even just the it's there's a there's a rhythm and a cadence to to commentary that it took me a while to to get into the hang of doing uh just like we were talking about before when we talked to rich mokini he a a great wrestling commentator Mm. he one of the things he taught us was that uh there's a rhythm to it in it you can get into the rhythm. It doesn't work for every single match, but there's a whole cadence to it, and you can just build it and build it and build it, and then there are big moments. Boom, it sounds good. You give it some energy. You give it a little extra oomph, and that's the way it's done. And, and uh, Kirsten was someone that I could just totally listen to all day long and, and get some, some little nuggets of knowledge from. Oh, yeah, and I mean, I'm... As soon as I turn, I like sometimes I'll turn on some of these shows and I'll watch one or you know a few matches to start. Come back to it a day later. So I found myself. I sat down the one night. I turned on one and I just kept watching, and I watched a lot of them in a row. And a lot of that had to do not only with the quality of the actual wrestling, but also that commentary team and just listening to them talk. And I'm like, I'm I'm enthralled in this. I am glued into this. I'm loving every bit of it. This this has been to me has been the most surprising. Of all the ones I, I knew what we were getting into with most of the ones to this point. This one I didn't realize how much I was gonna love Central States wrestling. Yeah, same thing here. I, I there there are some in the wrestling biz that, that call it kind of a so so territory or it was was this and it was that and it some big stars didn't go there because it didn't pay out quite enough. I don't know. I, I I've heard little minor criticisms like that throughout the years, but once I sat down and watched some of these entirety with that awesome commentary and all that, yeah, I'm I'm a fan for good. I love it. Oh, me too. Yeah, absolutely do. 
Again, I wanted to go across some of the names that came through the territory, talking about some of the uh, bigger names there, Baba Spokes. And then uh, you can elaborate on whichever ones you want to focus on or anything like that. But these are just, yep. again, scratching the surface because this would have taken forever to write down every damn name that ever graced this territory. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about some of the big ones. We had the Cuban Assassin, the Vaughn Eriks, Dick the Bruiser, Bulldog Bob Brown, uh, Afa, Sika, Giant Baba, Bob Backlund, Ronnie Garvin. Uh, Bart and Brad uh, Batten, uh, Nick Bockway, Golgerian, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, uh, Haystacks Calhoun, Billy Graham, Mike and Ted DiBiase, uh, Cowboy Bob Ellis, Buddy Landell, Jimmy Valiant, The Sheik, uh, and we're talking about the OG Sheik there as well. <laughs> so, yep. uh, Terry Funk, Dory Funk Jr., Dory Funk, uh, Greg and Vern Gagne, uh, Bob Geigel, of course, the Mongolian Stomper, which again, I'm familiar with Mongolian Stomper. Calgary Stampede did not under, know that Archie Goldie, he was making his way down to this territory, oh, yeah. which awesome. Alfred Hayes, as many of us in my age bracket grew up with Lord Alfred Hayes, the yep. uh, commentary guy in WWF. Lord Alfred Hayes was part of this one. Uh, Gene Kaniski, uh, Roger Kirby, Ernie Ladd, Dick Burdock, Bob Orton Sr. and Jr. and uh, even Andre the Giant graced his presence in this particular territory as well, too. So, I mean, and like I said, scratching the surface for the names that have been here. Yeah, like basically everybody, you know, and that, that's what's so cool about it is that this is a, like we talk about, in the middle of the Midwest, it's kind of geographically isolated to a certain extent just by the distance between uh, us. Those wrestlers back in those days filling up cars and doing the tours, trying to make some money. You don't want those long drives because that ends up costing you more money. It takes more money from what your payout was going to be to do all that traveling. Don't think they had uh, uh, traveling expenses so much back then unless you were a big star. But but um, they started that promotion organically with local stars, Midwest wrestlers, bringing them up creating something organically from nothing. And then once you got something good built there, plus a good ownership group, such as Orville Brown in the old days, a very respected uh, and former world champion wrestler, and then later Geigel, Pat O'Connor, and Harley Race as owners. Wow, there's a group. Two. They're going to attract a certain level of wrestler they can get that good talent they can pay them out what they deserve and those guys will come all the way out there do the little st louis kansas city tour and and get get a good pay, get a good payout for coming and driving all that way so i mean yeah just stars will be get stars once you start having harley race the funks the briscoes Dusty Rhodes and, and all the rest of the guys that you just named, which is pretty much all the big stars in wrestling at that time, it's going to attract more, more, and more, and more. And not only stars, but you need good job guys as well. That's super, super important to a promotion to get qualified and good journeyman job guys to make your TV look good and to make your stars look even better. Yeah, you bet, Bob Smokes. So uh, anything else that you want to say currently before, or do you think that this is a good time that we may go and watch a match for our friends over at Central States Wrestling? Absolutely. Anytime. Let's do it, Bob. All right. Well, I'm just going to get a spot ready here for us to put the media on the screen. Get that updated, and we will go. I have actually found, speaking of, Someone we were just talking about, talking about Andre the Giant. We've got one from Central States Wrestling. It is Andre the Giant in a handicap match taking on the team of Dave Nevins and Angel Rivera. So that is the match we're going to watch here, Pop Spokes. All right. Uh, yeah, Andre known for a lot of this, doing a lot of these matches where it's 2v1 two, two or situations where Andre was outnumbered, but because of his absolute, you know, large size and the attraction that he brought and stuff like that that was what people wanted to see they wanted to see that was a fair fight back in the days it was a fair fight to have two guys versus andre the giant 
For sure. And central states wouldn't have been any different than any of the other promotions at this time. You wanted to get that big featured talent, which was Andre. Andre, Andre, Andre. Everybody wanted Andre. And a lot of his booking rights were, were controlled by certain promoters in the U.S. when he came here. Most notably, Vince McMahon Sr., which would have been him at this time. He, Andre dealt with Vince Sr., and Vince Sr. booked him out to any other territories that came calling. Of course, McMahon taking a healthy booking fee for doing this as well, probably a 10 or 15% booking fee off the top of Andre's earnings. But then Andre had all his appearances set out, and all these small territory promotions could get the big guy coming in. And that would guarantee you a huge house for that show. Sure would. And we learned a lot about that when we reviewed the uh, Andre the Giant uh, book that we did here on Ring Respect Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go back and check out that episode. That was a fun time. But let's get into this right now. Here we go. This is Andre the Giant versus Dave Nevins and Angel Rivera from All-Star Wrestling, Central States Wrestling out of Kansas City. One man against two. The one man, period. Won't, uh, won't get us any strike. I'm sure we'll be fine as long as we're kind of doing the a little bit of our own commentary over that. But the absolute sheer size of Andre the Giant is just unreal. Unreal the attraction this man was. You know, it's nice to see him looking so spelt, too. Uh, a lot of people only remember his, his older days around WrestleMania 3 and all that kind of stuff when he was not very mobile and had the sore back and the sore hips and everything you could barely make it to the ring but this is andre we're going to see some better action from him in this he still looks pretty big but oh man well and my first actual uh real introduction to andre the giant because they started watching just after or around the time of wrestlemania 6 was him in that tag team uh, i was him and haku versus demolition at wrestlemania 6 and I mean, he did not move very fast in that matchup either. No, no. Haku did a lot of the work in those matches. Angel grabs hold and just shakes him off. Again, it's that commentary in the background there. If anyone can hear that, hopefully you can. It's just phenomenal. He looks around at Dave Nevin. Angel says, Nevin, come on in. Help me out. He's all yours. Yeah, give me a tag here, man. I'm getting nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think that uh, anyone's getting anywhere here with the Giant tonight. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, when we watched that uh, really old match of Andre's there, I think it was from like the 60s or something like that, where he was a grappler. And it's, you know, trying to sell that to people. Like, I, again, from the introduction I had to versus what we ended up watching throughout watching Andre's career stuff here, it's mind blowing the changes that this man went through and what he accomplished and stuff like that. When he was a grappler, holy shit, having a guy that tall that could grapple like Andre did at the beginning was something to see. Yeah, it was wild because he wasn't that big when he was 18 or when he started wrestling. So they just trained him as a normal wrestler. Like it was all flying head scissors and, and holds and leg locks and all that stuff. And we watched him young and handsome and in black and white doing all those all those wrestling moves. It's quite funny, eh? Yeah, a lot of them. But, but I mean, this kind of became the way of his careers later on and stuff, especially against, I mean... We're talking about two guys here. These would be considered job guys in the day, and not to insult what they do. They're doing a perfect job of it. There are a couple of guys getting in there, and they're putting the big man over. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. Like, these guys probably got paid handsomely compared to a lot of the undercard talent on here doing the match with Andre. You got to be careful. Andre wanted everything perfect in his matches. Not grumpy. If uh, guys didn't work the way he wanted them to, so it was an important spot working with Andre. Oh, oh Jesus! Oh, that's fantastic! Oh, you don't see the atomic drop uh, at all anymore. Like, I mean, it's just a move that's gone by the wayside all of a sudden. Well, that guy doesn't have a spine anymore. <laughs> and the handshake spot. 
That's with great. One hand. That was look at two times, three times. He tries to pick the guy up. <laughs> Uh, everyone's so, laughing at that attempt. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, <laughs> Another one of those two. <laughs> I think Bob Backlund must have taught Andre that. <laughs> and I'm oh, here we go. Up the other. Stack him up, Andre. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Good stuff. And I mean, and that's all you need. That was fun. That was a good wrestling matchup right there. I mean, not like, I mean, you're not talking five-star wrestling, anything like this. I mean, it was exactly what it needed to be. It was an appearance by Andre the Giant that the crowd loved and two guys that got paid handsomely to go in there and make the Giant look like a fucking big giant powerhouse. That's exactly it. And th this, this match was an exhibition match, so to speak. There was no angle, no heat, no feud going on, no nothing like that. Those guys were in there to spotlight how big the giant is and how strong he is. Therefore, the handshake spot, he's crushing the guy's hand, he, uh, lifting him up over his head, showing how strong he is. Those atomic drops where he just, he lifts those guys up like they're five-year-old kids, you know, like so easily. That's what the fans will go away from that match thinking like we just saw the giant today and he absolutely cleaned the clock of two guys he lifted them he just treated them like they were 80 pounds and that's that's the spectacle of andre the giant you're not going to get a, a one hour broadway or anything like that out of the giant you show how big he is that's what people want to see Oh, yeah, and again, like uh, those weren't small boys either, too. <laughs> You're talking no. about sizable dudes there, but up compared to Andre the Giant, they look like a couple of small... Or and Like you said, when he does the big moves like that, he makes them look like they're only 80-pound guys, but they're sure as hell not 80-pound boys by any stretch of the word. No, those are 200-plus pound wrestlers. Back in the days when you had to be 200 pounds at least to be a wrestler, and uh, yeah, again, just a showcase... It, it's um, the giant comes. You don't you don't really watch him to see his wrestling skill. You want to see him manhandle someone very much smaller than him. Yeah, yeah, and that's the you know again like he was like you've said about him being picky about who he worked with and how they worked and stuff like that. It's interesting to go back even throughout the book that we read and think documentaries you can watch where yeah there was specific people Andre loved working with. There was certain particular wrestlers that he loved he would have no problem working any match with them any time of the day and the ones he didn't <laughs> the ones he did he made a life a living hell if he was in the ring with them oh very much so and uh randy savage and the ultimate warrior were not among those favorites <laughs> no they were not but believe it, you know and again uh say it like this the Hart family were always favorable to the giant that was one of his favorite groups to work with well, until that one ride to the airport, I suppose. <laughs> well, so. there's always that. But, it's hey, it sounds like, and we learned that on a trip through the territories, driving yeah. in Canada can be a little bit of an issue, as our good friend Rachel Ling told us about the uh, classic story with herself and Owen Hart on the way to a show one night. For sure. Hilarious stuff and, and so fun to get some genuine stories. But uh, uh, while we're talking about uh, physical specimens and uh, and uh, wrestlers that benefit from having a great presentation, what about one of the long standbys for Central States Wrestling, Happy Humphrey? Did you read about him at all, Munson? I, I did read a little bit about Happy Humphrey, Papa Spokes. The yeah. heaviest wrestler ever. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what he actually weighed. His build weight was 802 pounds which makes him 200 more than Yokozuna ever was. Like, can you imagine the size of this guy? Yeah. And, like, yeah, just look at pictures. <laughs> it's like, holy shit, man. Like, talk about a big boy. Only six foot one. But, yeah, like you said, he was billed at 802 pounds. Happy Humphrey. Uh, like it. Yeah. I, 
I don't know if I could even doubt that. I mean, he's a he's a big dude. When you see the pictures with him against and guys that like uh, Haystacks Calhoun, another very very large individual, and he oh, kind yeah. of makes Haystacks look a little smaller. For sure. And uh, again, this was a this was a wrestler that the fans liked, not because he was doing flying head scissors and 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 arm drags and stuff like that, but because. Holy cow, look at the size of this guy. And that, I think that's always been one of the draws of wrestling is that it's part spectacle, part athletic competition, but part, I don't mean to say this in a mean way, but but part freak show in a way. You want to see the giant guy that's over seven feet tall. You want to see the guy that's 800 pounds because you've never seen any people like that before, mm -hmm. including all kinds of other looks and all kinds of other gimmicks and presentations and stuff. But you know, that's what they were going with getting Andre maybe once a year and having happy Humphrey there fans, fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fans would uh, watch these shows and go and tell their other friends that you've got to see this happy Humphrey guy. He's the yeah. biggest, fattest guy we've ever seen in our life. It's amazing. And that's that's a little bit of the draw of pro wrestling, I think. Yeah, it really is. Again, it's the draw of Prairie Pro Wrestling. Again, a lot of the most impactful ones bring something to the table. Again, maybe not so much in terms of the physical size, but what they produce at a ring or some sort of amazing spectacle of an entrance or something that they can do to connect to that crowd that instantly draws them to them and stuff like that. That's you know the the magic of wrestling in general is having that to like, as BDJ said, that, that eye test, there is a lot of that that goes on again. I don't necessarily, it's, you know, I can be a believer in, you know, terms of modern wrestling where a smaller person fights a bigger person. I even saw our good friend, Alex came pop folks posted something about in an MMA style matchup that a little guy with whatever background he had fighting background, he had took on a guy that was like almost near seven feet. And the little guy kicked the shit out of him. Sure. But the little guy has got skill. He's got a deadly skill that he is capable of with his feet and his fists that he's been trained on that makes him that way. When I see, and I, I again, I don't want to harp too much on particular people, but when certain wrestlers get in the industry and they're okay with being 80 pounds soaking wet, and not make themselves ever look believable or do moves that make me believe they're chopping down a big guy or something like that. You know, because even watching what Alex Kane posted, the little guy comes in and he's wrapping himself around the big guy and feeding him while he's got himself wrapped around him. Again, I can believe that because he went in, he used that speed, he got in on the big guy right away, took himself away from the reach of the big guy. And that's the thing. The big guy's going to have that reach. If he can keep you away... He's going to be able to keep you away for good, whereas you come in close and stuff like that, you take that weapon away, you de-weaponize the big guy and take him down from there. So there is ways to make it believable. It's just unfortunate that in a modern world, believable is we all play nice with each other. Yeah, yeah. You, well said, Munson. And, and like these, some of these examples you're talking about, I mean, a fighter with technique will beat a big and strong fighter nine and a half times out of ten because that technique is so very very important you're talking about an mma fight with a jiu-jitsu fighter versus a striker and wrestler kind of thing and and we all remember the first couple of ufc cards that where hoist gracie was the you know six yeah. foot tall 180 pounds against all bigger guys but he's got the technique with their asses Oh, absolutely. And he knows he can make you do things you don't want to do. He's watching for what you're going to do all the time. He wants your left arm. He's going to drop his right hand so that you punch in there. Yeah, now he's got you. It's all that stuff. It's all the experience and the savvy and the technique. And uh, that's in the, in the pro wrestling world. Um, a lot of wrestlers make that their bread and butter these days, but in the, in the, in the real territory times when matches were quite a lot more real and a lot less scripted than they were before guys like Luthes weren't the hugest guys of all time jack briscoe 
but they had that technique. And man, there's no substitute for that. The knowledge, the experience, the technique, it'll always take a big man down. You bet. Yeah. And I know, I know we're kind of drawing a little bit away from the central States wrestling stuff. So I yeah. want to take this opportunity because we are kind of getting towards the end of the hour here, pop smokes. Uh, is there anything else about central States wrestling that you'd like to touch on here? I'm sure you got a lot of notes. So I want to give the opportunity yeah. and the amount of time for you to go and talk about it. Well, you know, there is something I want to bring up too. Um, I, us as the video bros, we always find this interesting that, but they used to do their, they used to take their TV shows for all star wrestling on Thursday nights, and then they were shown on TV on Sunday mornings. You got three hours of wrestling a week. There was one show for the Kansas City and one show for the St. Louis. So um, that's kind of interesting. Just like we talked to, with Ross Hart about. They did it. They turned it around even quicker. They had their shows Friday night, and I think their show might have come out Saturday night. So as Ross told us, they got the they got the raw footage. They would, and they did it that night. They went to the studio or whatever spot they had, and now one guy's got to edit. They got to lay commentary down on that, or else edit the commentary and make sure that's all good. Pack it up, put it on the final tapes. And then just drive it over to the TV station. Here you guys go. Here's the show for tonight. Like, wow, isn't that amazing? Hey, and these guys had a couple extra days, but it's, you know, I just like thinking about the fans when they would watch it. You know, lots of people know Saturday night at 6.05 with Georgia Championship Wrestling and all that kind of stuff. Well, from Kansas City and St. Louis, it was Sunday morning. Now, some churchgoers might have found that a, an inconvenience, but apparently not too much because that show was really big and really popular. One of the uh, the local TV affiliates' bigger shows on that station. Yep. And you know what? It's actually it's funny you brought that up because uh, Ross Hart kind of was the inspiration for the way I turn around PPW matches now. Uh, so just to give a little background on that. So before... You know, there's a lot of time between where we are in the YouTube releases versus what's been taped, but we are getting to that point of caught up, and I, I needed a little bit of that fire lit under me, and when I heard Ross talking about that, I'm like, I gotta get down to it, and the last two shows, Pop Smokes, I have turned those things around yeah. like a fiery SOB. I I think the, fir the very last set of tapings or whatever, I think I had turned those around that same weekend, and then this most recent set of ones I had done within half a week this time around, and able to, you know, for anybody who worked the matches that wants their matches ahead of time so that they could send them for potential bookings and stuff like that, instead of just sending them hard cam footage or one camera where, you know, they don't get, uh, you know, full on everything, they get the full edit without the commentary uh, pr prior to it and everything like that, and it's been, it's been awesome, but it's, it's the inspiration I've drawn from the people we have met and talked to and stuff like that, that have made me work harder and made me do those things and inspired me to do those things too. And yeah, it's, it's been great, man. It really has. Oh, you're a workhorse Munson. And, <laughs> and to speak for all of the uh, PPW management and the PPW nation, we, we got to give you thanks because I don't think everybody even knows the amount of hours you put in to all this, but, but I know because you tell me and, 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 and uh, I've seen some of your edits and all that, and it's just absolutely fantastic work. And, and you're one of the cornerstones of PPW, without question. Thank you, Bob. So <laughs> <laughs> the BDJ, the thanks best. for remembering that one. BM for G, uh, Bobby Munson for General Man. Someday, love it. Someday, maybe, 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 maybe BDJ. You looking for a cameraman position? No. <laughs> But unless Paul the Smokes has something to say about it, you never know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he wants that spot. Maybe, maybe it could be possible. I never know what could happen in the realm of Prairie Pro Wrestling moving forward. What I can tell you is uh, I had a blast talking about Central States Wrestling. Uh, we do have Prairie Pro Wrestling coming back up here, Papa Smokes, in a very short period of time. Uh, it hasn't been officially announced in terms of the release on social media, so stay tuned. The official announcement will come soon. But yes, Saturday, August the 17th, in Saskatoon, we've got more live Prairie Pro Wrestling action coming at the people. I'm so stoked for it. As we, you know, again, it's really cool because we did commentary 
for the matches that we have. And it's we're halfway through the last set of tapings, the most recent set of tapings. So we're getting to that point where we're a little bit more caught up to date for our fans all over the world to be along with us for this incredible ride. And I'm I'm so pumped because, man, we hit August, Papa Smokes, and that's it. That's that go-home show before the Ring of Horrors, our biggest show of the year. And you know that that's going to be a chaotic night, one hell of a night for everybody. Oh, absolutely. The big show of the year. But you just reminded me of one thing. One more thing I want to bring up about Central yeah. Space Wrestling Months. And since you brought up the PPW Nation and the awesome fans we have, what about two of the most awesome and most devout wrestling fans ever in Kansas City, Murty and Gertie, the old ladies that were twins. You remember this? Yeah. <laughs> Did you see anything in, in the in your research about that? Yeah. They went to the matches for years. I don't even know how many years, 30 years or 20 years or something like that. And I remember at the AWA matches when I was a little kid, there was a lady that had been going to the matches there for, again, something ridiculous, like 30 or 40 years, an old lady, and she used to do the same thing as Murdy and Gertie, get right into it, and then kind of try and interfere in the matches sometimes. I remember she, the lady I'm talking about used to hate Bobby Heenan so much, and you would see her, she had a crooked back and everything else, but she would walk, and just that purse would come up, and she'd try and swing it by the handle of the purse at Bobby Heenan. And he would kind of hear it behind him and, oh, Jesus, it's her again. This is what Murdy and Gertie reminded me of. And as Harley Race said, they were stick pins, ladies. They had those long needles in their bags, and they would try and get you, wrestlers, the heels, in the butt or in the leg or wherever with those pins. You had to watch out for Murdy and Gertie. They were the most devout fans you could hope for. Oh, yeah. And again, I, I, I absolutely love that. Not that I oh, can own yeah. stabbing wrestlers in a modern world, but it's, you know, we've had shit here and it, it's quite funny as BDJ. Uh, we have the old man in the water bottle at BPW. <laughs> <laughs> we also had the old man in the cane back in the HIW days. We had, yeah, yeah. I don't know. If, BDJ probably I don't I'm sure you've heard about it, but there was even something at the most recent PPW show where somebody decided to puff their chest out at good old El Asesino there, and he uh, he got shoved back pretty heavily more than one time that evening. Did he ever? Yeah, and as we said before, be a respectful fan. You can yell, you can jeer, but if you want to puff up or try and touch a heel. It's not a good idea because they can't back down from you. Just don't do it because you're going to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> BDJ is going to press charges. Please do against El Asasino. Get his ass behind bars. He deserves it. <laughs> oh, BDJ got his cat flipped off by a certain wrestler back in the high impact days uh, when things were getting a little heated out in the crowd there. <laughs> it happens. Hey, anything can happen when yeah, you go to a live pro wrestling show here in Saskatoon. But uh, we are coming to the very end of the program here, Pop Smokes. It's been a delight doing trip through the territories. Looking forward to the next one that we have to so. do. We've got some great shit lined up for you guys. Uh, but in the meantime and in between time, we are going to encourage you, if you're watching live, to stick around for the Honor Ramble coming up. Auntie Collins is going to be joining joined by Sam, who's going to be a returning guest, talking about Ring of Honor. So go enjoy watching those ladies talk all things ROH. And now watch as I cry just a little bit inside because the show got a lot more costly because Papa Spokes' ticker was right there on the screen. Try not to shed too many tears, Munson. It's one of the it's one of the expenses that we have to do for this show. It's so true. check out Papa Smokes' high money ticker. I can be found at Elon Musk's free speech wonderland known as X. I am at smokes underscore Papa. You can also find me on Twitch at Papa underscore smokes underscore. That's where you can find Pop Smokes. As for myself, there is the ticker down below on X. I am at Real Bobby Months and Instagram and Threads at Video Bros SK and Twitch. It's at Video Bro underscore Bobby Munson. Where can you catch me? You're going to be able to find me again this Sunday. Being joined by Mark Robson, who's going to be a continued 
uh, partner in crime with me on Sundays here. We're going to be talking things on point of view. We're going to be talking about the week in pro wrestling. We're going to be talking about the week in football, a.k.a. soccer, to the North American fans here because there's lots to talk about in those fields. And anything that you want to bring up, bring it on up on a Sunday morning with myself and Mark Robson. Uh, then what else I got going on? I, well, I might even be on the Slammer, TNA Slammiversary thing on Saturday night post show here on the channel as well too so that's a very big possibility tna is doing some good stuff and i'm curious to check out something seeing as i've recently divorced mlw due to their high costly pricing to get their content uh, but i do wish all the best to everybody who's still in mlw that you know has ever done anything for us and stuff like that again i'm not willing to make the investment right now but fuck change my mind change my mind that's what i that's what i asked so yeah but yes, that's, I mean yeah it would look a lot tastier if just the product was better. And, and I'm not sure what happened there, but I think I think that Court will come around again. He's created greatness a couple of times. I think he'll do it again, but uh, till then, we'll just kind of watch from the sidelines, I guess. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Once it gets uh, once it peaks with the interest of the kind of stuff I'm into a little bit more, I'll be right back there. It won't it's not a forever divorce. It's a temporary. See you later, kind of thing. Uh, but yeah. with that said, uh, you are watching currently on OLE Podcast or on the Video Bros Network. Please subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, give this video a thumbs up, and make sure to leave us a comment in the comment section below. You can also catch myself and Papa Smoke calling all the action on Prairie Pro Wrestling every Saturday afternoon. We got a new match coming out this Saturday, so stay tuned for that. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Ring Respect Radio, and we will see you in one week's time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>